Hello and welcome everyone to our LinkedIn Live Manufacturing 4.0 Club. Uh, today, <clears throat> our topic is again, manufacturing future uh, and technology. And uh, we're joined here today with uh, Toby Strout, uh, who's gonna give us a little bit of an insight to low code, no code technologies out there, what's been used in the manufacturing space, how far are we, where are we going, and that I'm also joined here today by Ari Sharp, my co-host from Industry 4.0 Club from Phoenix Contacts. And so we're looking forward to a great conversation here today on, on this, this topic of low code and no code. Um, before we start, just some quick, quick introductions. My name is Jan Pingel. And when I'm not here with these great people talking about technology, I'm uh, working for Ingo Soran, where I'm a product leader for digital solutions where we are equipping our, equip, our compressors with uh, remote connectivity, making them smart and connected. Uh, quick, over to you, Ira, for an introduction. Sure, yeah, thanks a lot, Yen. So my name's Ira Sharp. Um, as Yen said, I'm a co-founder here at the Industry 4.0 Club. Love having these conversations, particularly looking forward to this conversation here. We had a little chat before we just jumped on live and and uh, yeah, I just think this is this is right up uh, my alley, and I think it's good for the community and everything else. When I'm not here having these conversations, I'm the director of marketing at Phoenix Contact for all the automation products in the U.S. And uh, yeah, just uh, just really enjoy talking about open automation, automation, and Industry 4.0, and all the other associated things. So, Jan? Great. And uh, so, quick, Toby. Uh... If you can give a quick introduction of, of uh, what you're doing, and uh, then uh, we can uh, start a conversation, a very interesting conversation about low code, no code. All right. Uh, my name is Toby Strouch. I've got roughly 20 years in the business and uh, currently independent contractor. Um, and I have a personal interest in low code, no code. Um, I taught a um, no drag class recently got into a little bit of the history of it um and then started looking at you know how we're utilizing it in a, in a manufacturing environment okay so so toby would you say you got your flow on sorry that was bad because <laughs> <laughs> i just got to start it off that way yeah, yeah well i mean if you don't have flow then you know it's it's not going to work out for you so. <laughs> um so so uh, Toby, you you uh, you you've been working in this area for quite a while and have kind of seen the changes of traditional um, PLC programming system architecture, et cetera. Can you give us a quick idea of what what is low code, no code? Um, where do you see it in in different areas of a of a plant floor or in in regards to the ISO ninety five architecture, whatever? Okay. Um, yeah, the, um, so, so if we look at basic definitions, you know, low code is something that um, a programmer is going to be involved in, but not extensively, um, you know, like we're not going to bring in machine language and start from the get go. Um, most people are familiar with Node-RED. Um, I've been working with Crosser um, and it's a node oriented drag and drop type software. You know where we're seeing that, or where you've seen it in the last ten years, is is you know Polyscope is a is a big thing for universal robots, um, and then building automation, um, Ni Tritium Niagara framework built off of the HTML, and then they went to JSON um, about the time that that everybody else on the IT side did, like in 2011 uh, ish. And I bring up JSON because that allows us to have like the function blocks and then you, you know, you're just adding parameterization um, in that function block and then dragging your lines across and connecting it. Um, kind of like what you see in uh, LabVIEW, which I'm not totally familiar with the LabVIEW environment, but same idea. Um, and those, you know, those are, those are things that have been interesting to me um, as far as in relation to ISA 95. The um, what you're seeing is an increase in taking uh, data from the sensor all the way up to you know to the the top layers where you're populating the MES and the ERPs, um, or all the way to the cloud. I mean, you've had some people advertising you know sensor all the way to cloud. That's one of Crosser's big pushes, um, and I think. 
I'm going to open up the door for the PLC part. The, um, you know, one of my interests is, is, is looking at anomalies because I think we should be able to use something like Node-RED uh, or the Node type software to detect anomalies for cybersecurity in the OT network. Um, you know, but also the edge computing and putting it on the PLCs, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's what we're seeing more of. Um, Bosch is pushing the control X. You got the Opta 22. And, and as Ira reminded me earlier that Phoenix contact is involved in that as well. So, so, so is the, is the, 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 the low code perspective today, uh, so I, I'm from more of the traditional working from Rockwell. I work for Honeywell now, I work for Ingersoll Rand. Um, and uh, you would think, or at least you, you typically see a, a, a piece of equipment in a manufacturing plant, a packaging line or um, a heating tank or something. It has a PLC on it, it's traditionally programmed. Uh, you mentioned uh, universal robots. Um, so is that, is that, is at the control level, is that some, areas of specific type of application like robotics, uh, maybe, um, what am I thinking here? Uh, just some specific things where you know that you want to be able to change things a little bit more agile than that machine you bought from an OEM that's sitting there and you just load it with a recipe and it does what it's supposed to do. And if you'll see code is, you know, if it's not, no, if it isn't broke, don't touch it. Right. right don't, don't but, but, it. But, but robotics and other areas, you need to make changes. You need to make, you know, here, here's a new product. I got to, I got to program it again. Right. So is, is that typically where you see at that level on the floor um, that you use low code, no code today? No, um, where I've seen it more is on the data level. I, I bring up the polyscope because that's their environment is, is allowing them to plug and play. Um, and they've got the whole, what they've done on their business side is, is make the polyscope open so that it's more integratable, um, so that they can have, you know, like the robotiques and the, the end effectors and, and you can buy an end effector and a camera and it's already got pre, like prefabricated software in the polyscope environment that, you know, from an integration standpoint that it's going to, it's going to talk to you are, um, and, and so it's saving you some design time there, uh, or at least on the floor time. But it's still, if I understand your question, it's still at a higher level software wise. Okay. So down here, you're still, you know, taking care of your OR gates and your ANDs and, you know, the more PLC traditional type code would, would be below that, that functionality. Um, you know, and so, you know, one of the questions you asked me before is how can we make uh functions that that somebody on the plant floor can just you know modify and from the research that i did that's what you know some of the blocks that are in the the um the you know, like tritium niagara on the on the business automation side you're configuring a block and you know if we relate that to uh rockwell then you know if i there's blocks in their library that i can pull out and make changes to that that don't affect, you know, the the lower end of the machine, the machine type level, um, but you still have to know what the block is doing. You know? So you still have to, you know, and that's like a low code instance. You know, no code would be, you can be a non technical person and you're just gonna attach your inputs and outputs and and get the response that you want. Um, and I think, I think that's where we have room to expand. Um, and using it more for functionality as opposed to just data gathering. Yeah, and and so you know, with that example, so on the date from the data perspective, um, I am curious, where do you see this in the sense of if you look at a traditional control system, you have sensors and actuators, and then those will typically tie up into some sort of like a PLC for the actual control and operations. And then that would go into some sort of visualization and maybe you have some data collection there in a traditional sense. But with your integration of your low no code on the data side that you mentioned, right. do you see that as kind of your bridge from OT to IT? Or maybe, maybe those are the wrong words. I, I know no, this is a very sensitive subject. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, not for me. I'm, I'm just about the, the, the bits. I, I don't care. It's on off yeah. and get the yeah. data across. But um, 
Yeah, exactly. That's what that's what Crosser is advertising it as. That's what um, there's another, you know, without throwing their commercial stuff out there, the, there's another software platform, Litmus, I believe. And that's what they're using as far as ISA 95. And, and that's something that if, if you think about it, our hardware has changed in the last few years. We can do more at a hardware level than what we did before. Um, you know, prime example is the the MQTT, the um, Bluetooth. You know, like um, who's the sensor people that start with the V? You know, you 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 plug in your there you go. yeah. You, you can put it all on Bluetooth. You guys can walk by maintenance wise and and see the status of those flow meters or temperatures. Um, you know, and and to me, that's making it you know along uh, along Jan's perspective you know, that's making it easier on the plant floor um and those are the type of things where we should be taking where node red is and you know, like like it's been around since the early 2000s and we need to take those low code examples and, and make it easier for the plant floor and that's where we should be putting it into you know it's taken us 10 years to get familiar with it or, or more comfortable to now you know, um, I mean, for me, it, it'd be more like, you know, take a controls person and and let's go build something that a, a plant can use that, that makes it that makes it easier. I mean, that's what it should be about. So. So what what do you think is the biggest challenge then? So, I mean, you, you're an independent contractor. You're looking at this low, no code, you know, doing this, this, um, this piece here. Like, what is the biggest challenge for someone to integrate this kind of stuff? What's what's holding people back? As, as far as like utilizing the, it's so, I mean, our industry is finicky as far as confident, confidence. Finicky um, is a good word. Yeah. And <laughs> reliability and trust. I mean, that, that, you know, and not to, I, y'all correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't want to, but I mean, if we look at the Rockwell giant, um, they're the elephant in the room, right? People are confident with Rockwell because they've got the software support. Um, if you're choosing an open source, type availability or low code, no code. I mean, there, every conversation I've had about Node-RED, people have pushed off, you know, pushed it away. Um, it, it comes up reliability and can I deal with it on the plant floor? How do I get out of, there's times that you can add a functionality to Node-RED and the whole thing will cough up on you. And, um, and then you're like, okay, what's my recoverability? And you may not have time you know, if it's on the plant floor to sit there and, and get it back up and running. So, you know, and, and to, to Jan's point of view that, you know, hardware wise, if you're affecting control, then then you're you're at risk and, and people don't want to deal with that um, when it comes to operations. So, um, you know, Crosser is a commercial, commercialized version of Node-RED. Um, and like, like you mentioned, you know, the Bosch is the Opti 22s, Phoenix, you know, you guys are putting it on the, on the processors for the purpose of edge computing. Um, but right now it's still all data gathering. So we're not using it for control. Um, and for me, that's where the, if we were to do, you know, like follow the hyper manufacturing or the hyper automation type scale ups. Uh, you still need the people behind the scenes to build the functionality in um, that can make it so that someone on the plant floor can can make it more no code as as opposed to low code. So, so um, interested to me, from from my perspective, um, I, I see what you mean by Rockwell and Siemens and others. I mean they they got a specific business, and and as soon as you go to open source it becomes a different type of business. So you, you got to figure out how, and I, I, I'm, I don't know, I can't tell the future for those guys if that's at some point they need to consider it or not. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking here, thinking a little bit about Kodak and uh, digital film, right? You get at some point, yeah, somebody else comes up with a with a better solution, broader solution that scales. And and you you might have to then consider your uh, change in your business. And the question is, will it be too late? Who knows? Um, but uh, uh, what I'm also interested in, in, especially when you're talking about the data side, um, uh, I, I, I still have a hard time seeing, you know, using, especially when, we, when I used to ladder logic, right? And you, you know exactly how you can control a PLC. You know exactly 
um, from a real-time OS perspective, how things are happening inside the PLC. You're making sure that you you sometimes even need to know what is the response time of some of those sensors and uh, right. cycle probably. And as soon as you put something that's more like low code, no code, there can be an issue there that you're not considering those specific aspects and the code might not work as you expect it because you're not that there might be a, the turnaround time for this particular process might be too long or something. I don't know. Uh, and again, I'm talking completely without knowing ever touching low code, no code on the plan for. So I, I can't say that it's it by experience. Yeah, but, but that's I, one I, of the that's one of the things. I mean, like people talk about the latency that comes up sometimes with ignition. Um, yeah. So then you come up with a you have to manage your data your data lack of better terms data plan, but um, you know, and then also your structure and your coding. So if you have registers that are put aside that can update when they change based on um, and, and keep it separate, um, yeah. You know, so you're controlling over here, but then update your data on a cyclic or, or whatever, depending on what what type of screen that you have or what type of data that you have. Um, then then it can happen behind the scenes, and the hardware has changed or I mean, really, we don't have a traditional PLC anymore. In, in my yeah. mind, we have computers. And that's, yeah. Yeah. you know, that's part of the arguments that I see on LinkedIn as far as like, oh, PLC this or whatever. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, go look at your processor and compare it to 1985. And it's not the same anymore. <laughs> no, so. absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I can see the low code, no code, absolutely on the data side, right? It, right. It, you, 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 and, and it's not not even new, right? I mean, especially when in the old days when you had OPC, not old days, it's still got still have OPC. But OPC, OPC is not going to go away. <laughs> OPC is not going to go away. But typically, when we said we had a, a you know one second scan rate. That just means right. that you would get data one second or slower, uh, probably somewhere between one and two seconds. But it wasn't deterministic, right? And that's right. Just, and, and you were okay with that. So if you start putting low code, no code to solution about getting that data. Um, maybe aggregating that data up into the different layers of the business, that's fine. Nobody, nobody has uh, is worrying about that. It's just on the control side that that I'm uh, that I'm still thinking that it would take a little bit longer before some of those type of components get into the control level of actually. But I, I, I can agree. see it happening. I mean, we have function blocks on the on the on the PLC um, development side. That's you know, and, and a lot of those function blocks, you might you know that it's basically just configuring them, right? All the codes locked in, you don't touch any of the code, you just set the parameters and put the block the right place and it does what it's supposed to do. Yep. So there's a little bit of a low code, no code there as well, right? Right, um, and that's that's what I've seen with, um, you know, like not to mention the, the, the bad word pack ML or whatever, but when you, you know, there's, there's differences in code that we're looking at for, um, for, for, for like the real time processing. You know, just like just like if you fly the space shuttle, they, they don't use a bunch of object-oriented code. I mean, it's all going to be sequential because they don't want that overhead. Um, same thing with the real-time processing. If you're if you're taking a, a compressor with the Ingersoll Rand and you're running it, and you're making decisions based on your feedback coming in with your temperature and your airflow, you don't want to have to wait five seconds for whatever to, you know some kind of aggregative data, blah blah blah, and this is your best number. Um, you know, so you're 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 processing it at a different point or a different for a different purpose, and exactly. I think that we have to understand that with the PLCs and our traditional logic and putting that data. If we're going to put it on the plant floor, then um, you know, decipher how we're going to code for the difference of talking talking to a SCADA, talking to the cloud, uh, as opposed to your real time processing. You know, you can, like what. You mentioned earlier about the separation on the safety PLC code. Um, and I, I think that that goes with programming smarter um, and having segmented, you know, like, um, so 2004-ish, 2005-ish, I was on a plant floor and I opened up, you know, 500 code. Um, I had 1,250 ladders or 1,250 rungs all in one ladder. Well, I freaked them out because I took them out and started segmenting it yeah. into different um, different wow. ladders. Yeah. And you know, and automatically, you know, the traditional guy is like, "Well, you're killing my timing, or you're this or that." And and even with 
ladder rungs, you have to be aware of the sequence of your operations and you may cause something to be delayed or you may cause something to happen, you know, out of, you know, there's, there's considerations that programmers looked at even, even just doing traditional ladder. Well, if we're adding this object oriented type, you know, low code type environment, then yeah, we absolutely have to think about what the box is. And, and that's, you know, that's understanding how we program, that's understanding what you're programming. And that's, you know, one of the fallacies that, I don't want to sound negative, the, one of the things I see with the people that are implementing these quick solutions, you know, they don't look at um, when they're configuring one of those boxes for hardware, you can't just copy and paste. And, and that's one of the differences between um, software engineering, I think, and, and bringing in a controls person that knows you know, hey, I got to know what size my my uh, BFD is or what it's talking to, because otherwise, you know, I'm going to undersize it in the code, then my alarming is going to be off or, you know, or something. I mean, those are those are things that we have to consider the hardware. And it's not just a computer, you know, and do I have enough CPU? It's actually how does it work? You know, yeah. so right. so when, when you think about all this and, and you're talking about this no code, low code, I, I'm. I think I hear you, but I, I want to ask a, a very direct question on it. So do you see low code, no code being used on the process control side? So like you're actually like looking at sensors, you're sizing that VFD, you're doing that operations, or do you, you said it earlier that you saw it more on the data side, but just trying to blend these two things because a controller, a computer, a PLC, a whatever you yeah. want to call it on the factory floor can do different types of things. Right. Um, you know, where do you see that actually being used today or where are you using it today or where are you considering using it? So, so building automation is using it, um, but the, the Tritium controllers are set up differently. Mm -hmm. uh, they started out with HTML and now they're more JSON based. And, and typically it's oh, typically it's more non-critical control um, versus right. where but you I mean, if you're with critical if you're starting up a, a motor, I mean, you can still send the start command from the PLC, but if you've got your safety set up properly, you know, you're still your your critical part is still gonna still gonna be there. But timing wise, I don't have to. I'm not doing. Um, you know, building automation doesn't do motion control. Right. Um, yeah. You know, so I think those things will be built out. I think they'll expand as far as the low code, no code, and you know, part of that. I mean, look at the the. I mean, it's low code for me to, to go into Rockwell software and I've got move commands um, for their motion, you know, for their motion control that's built into their library. So if I go into say Beckoff, you know, yeah, they got move commands as well, but but their functionality is a little bit different being code sys based. Um, and so I have to understand those differences as a programmer um, and know that I've got to, even if I declare the function over here, I've got to, uh, call out, instantiate it. Um, otherwise, you may miss one of the cycles because it's faster. So um, those are things that, that you have to understand if you're going to try to create blocks that can that can save time. Because it, it really doesn't save you time if you don't understand the block that you're choosing. Um, so to me, there's a caveat with low code, no code in that you're you're not taking away you still have to have the technical people behind the scenes to understand what, what those black boxes are doing, whether it's a physical black box or a software black box. So now I feel like we're talking about AI and, you know, well, like <laughs> so, and, and that's what uh, Crosser has got case studies where they're using the low code um, node type software to bring data into the cloud. And, and they're doing that specifically for machine language or machine learning. And and that's, you know, you, you guys both mentioned edge computing before. You know, so, you know, I guess the thing that we'd have to look at for manufacturing is how much, how important is the data as opposed to real time? And it seems like, you know, we're, it's, it's kind of hard because if you're on a maintenance team, then your pants are on fire and it's all about the real time. If you're doing OEE and you're doing projections and you want to know, like even with plastics, if you're extruding, um, you're constantly looking at your mix. So you know, can I make a better plastic? You know, or putting copper on a on a roll with an electrode process. The 
those are all things that you got scientists behind the scenes that are making, you know, they're looking at the data. So the data is not going to go away in manufacturing either. I think if we're going to become smarter manufacturing, we got to understand the PLC layer has to send the data up. It's not going to go away. But from a maintenance standpoint, if you're just, you know, I'm up or I'm down, then, then yeah, you need the real time processing. And the, um, so maybe it's something um, like you guys mentioned earlier, as far as separating out the cores so that you're dealing with the data um, and then dealing with the, how to process it so that you don't have the same type of latency. Um, I mean, if you think about the amount of data that we're processing today, I mean, you, <laughs> an international paper, we had guys that wanted, you know, we had, I swear we had 30,000 tags. Yeah, you're not moving that to the cloud and back and actually making execution decisions on it. No. Right, but how often did they use all 30,000 tags? It's like zero. They, yeah. a, a guy would come in from corporate to analyze something I, you sit over his shoulder and you watch, you pull up maybe 10 tags, you know, for that instance. And then it's that instance over X amount of days, you know? And so if you can capture that kind of environment with the data and then plug that into your machine learning, then you can start, um, you know, alleviating some of the upsets or, or pinpointing, Hey, it's, you know, when this guy operates it, he's doing, he's putting the system between, here and here, when that guy operates at nights, he's, you know, he's in a different layer. And that, you know, so it, it goes back to data, but it depends on what your priority is, so. Yeah, that's why um, we, we, we mentioned earlier when we were just talking uh, between ourselves here, a little bit about OPC, right? So the new yeah. OPC standards, are, I think is also critical for that perspective of, you know, there's no need to take 30,000 tags into a story. Right. If you can do OPC and the and the vendor that created that particular piece of equipment is, you know, taking the, let's say, 200 different tags on that one machine, but only really exposing the 15 that, that makes any sense for somebody that doesn't know the intricacies of how this machine is programmed, et cetera, right? Just taking those and exposing those in, and then, then the customer can take those and, and use system state aggregation and local no code and into historian and SCADA system and whatever, but they don't have to deal with all those minute, small detailed tags that have been used just to, and some of them are really just at the PLC level to measure, to make sure that my machine doesn't have a catastrophic failure of some sort, right? right. But they're really not used for the business side. It, it's not about, they don't have any impact on the pro on the product quality that's coming out of the machine, et cetera. So there's definitely some areas there at the at the data level where you can simplify a lot and then easily have some low code, no code application sitting in, the, in as a middle layer to use that information, be able to compare three machines together at the right level. Don't have to worry about you know uh, uh, different vendors' machines. What what what's the same value in this machine versus this machine versus that machine? getting some of that standardization as, as part of it too. I, I think it, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for not just having low code, no code, but using this entire infrastructure to kind of start looking at standardizing that data infrastructure that the low code, no code is used for today, right? Agreed. Now, well, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Well, cause we've mentioned OPC a lot, but um, one of the things that I read um, when going down my path with this um you know we've got mqtt that's become popular in the last few years um so you know hardware and protocols are changing so so one guy that i read was like well is software keeping up um you know because typically software is always ahead of the hardware it's or it's, so it seems but i mean at this point are we keeping up yeah i you know and i found that question interesting um you know, because MQTT allows us to get some of that data quicker, um, but it still comes down to the organization that you're talking about. And then there's so many different points of view. Um, you know, like if you ask a guy about putting a, you know, where to put the SCADA in the, in the architecture of things, you know, do I put it on the plant floor or do I put it in the cloud? You know, those, those type of, of discussions. And, and in my mind, for the cloud to be beneficial, you have to segregate out the data that is important, um, not only for security, but also just for the cost and then keeping that 
that in between layer on the plant floor um, and then maybe have your redundancy in the cloud so that you can have a backup as opposed to, you know, if you have that catastrophic failure that's on the plant floor, um, the cloud gives you that opportunity. And instead, you know, we've, to me, you know, talking about data, we've kind of misused the cloud in some respect as far as trying to dump everything there. And that, that wasn't the point at all, but in, in my mind, but the, um, you know, it's, so there's a lot of questions that arise based on the comments that you made because, you know, it is about deciding what is important and not, you know, and, and how you want to manage it. And there's so many opinions. It's, it's very hard to. Yeah. It's interesting because I would actually be under the opinion to the point of that, like where I would want to get everything to a common point. And then from there, if all of the tags are there, regardless of what it is, because I don't know what's going to be important yet. Yeah. then figure out what's important to whatever asset that I'm going towards. So whether that's maybe a SCADA has some of it, maybe a historian has some others, you know, whatever it may be. Um, but then you get into the the factor of cost and storage and all these other things. But I don't yeah, necessarily... Terabytes are expensive. <laughs> yeah, and I don't... But, but at any particular point in time, you don't necessarily know what's important. You know what's important to you now, but three years from now, you know, wouldn't it have been nice to have that particular metric trended over the time so I can figure out if this is good or bad or whatever. I always use the example of the NFL, right? And this con concussion thing and the head-to-head -head collisions that are now, um, you know, banned. And the reason that was done was because of data that was collected previous so they could show that it was actually causing problems longer term. Now, right. I, I think logically you could probably have figured that out, but at the end of the day, we needed data to be able to back up those kinds of assessments. So uh, yeah, and is this the next generation of manufacturing? Is is data as an important of commodity almost as the thing that a manufacturer is actually producing? I don't know. A, a quick comment to that. I, I do agree with you that uh, you know you don't know what data is necessary or or critical in the future, but at the same time, I think it's very important to kind of look at what type of machine and who's the expert on the machine. So we, in our example from English Oman, we have machines with sometimes up to 250 data points on a single machine. Um, we have customers that try to collect all that. And what we see why? is, <laughs> well, yeah, why too? But that's just because they don't know what they don't know, right? Uh, right, but, right. I can see you guys wanting it for your own reasons. We definitely want it, absolutely. And we, we're collecting it through our cloud infrastructure, but our customers, they, they oftentimes do the same. And what we find is that they collect all that data and don't use it at all because they don't really know what it means. Uh, we know what all those integral data points mean inside the system and how they're controlled. And what we would like to do is just expose the one, either the, the real data points or the aggregated data points, which could be calculation of some sort, that is really important to how you control and, and run the actual machine, right? And I think that that's critical that sometimes you you're doing you look at it from a perspective of it's not really necessary for me to pull every single data point from a machine because at the end of the day you get a thirty thousand tag historian and only hundred points are ever ever displayed in an HMI somewhere that you're actually looking at, right? And that means you're you're basically just wasting that information and and never get to really look at it. So so that I, I think that there's there's definitely two sides to it. I think there's a lot of of, of areas where there is specific machines, specific machines that that there are experts from a, from a vendor that knows everything about them, but but what, what we as a, as OEMs need to ensure is that we actually expose the right information to our customers so that they can actually make the right decisions, and not necessarily just uh, provide. I mean, we we provide absolutely, but but some guidance around you know don't take the 300 point, take these 20 points because that's really how you you can see what our machine's doing and how it's performing it's is. interesting um so my master's is systems engineering and i've always thought that we should do the bath type graph thing with uh, manufacturing either a line or equipment um and if you maintain it properly then you can get the same longevity out of a line that you get, you know, like with aircraft. I mean, that's one reason why we didn't have to start replacing 1970s aircraft until, you know, until recently. Um, and, you know, I've had customers that wanted us to count, you know, like 15 years ago, they just wanted us to count every single time that the valve moved. 
and um, you know to point to hey this is when I'm going to change out that valve before it had a problem with stiction or you know some kind of mechanical issue based on their engineer looking at the you know hey we chose valve xyz and xyz has a lifespan of this many moves um so with that in mind that's where the data to me would come in to making it um to help in the plant floor and the machine learning as far as the reliability and the maintenance environment but what i'm seeing is that we're not that requires a lot of manpower and a lot of behind the scenes homework and and someone thinking ahead long enough to to make the line or the equipment that that robust um with the data system and you know some of the push for this very fast manufacturing or very fast uh build up on you know for making machines you know we're not we're not doing some of the old school engineering that we used to do um and and i think it'll bite us eventually so maybe that's why you know people are like well i got three thousand points so i'm gonna pull them all in because i don't know <laughs> it's like yeah, specifically around that, that that counting of the valve opening and closing, etc. I think that's really something where the I'm hoping that the OEMs would step up and yeah. make sure that's in the control and somehow um, so that because there would be in their interest to click a little insight that says, hey, you got three valves that are getting close to that point, and and here we can offer those valves and, and a service uh, uh, agreement or or service uh, uh, opportunity for us to go and come and install the new valves and make sure the machine lasts longer, right? I think yeah, that, well, and I was working for an OEM at the time, and but but we didn't have that on every HMI that was specifically for that that and it you know it was in the wastewater industry, so that was for that customer that they wanted it to be visualized. But yeah, to your point, I mean, it's a it's a opportunity regardless. Uh, absolutely, and and I think too is that that uh, the OEMs have at least if they're starting to collect data from the entire install base. They have the opportunity to say, well, it's not really 3,000, it's actually 5,000. I can see that from history. I can see that from a giant install base that you don't have to replace that 3,000. You can wait until 5,000. See, now you're talking my language. I'm the marketing guy. So I'm <laughs> in that, like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so be able to kind of schedule that PM, uh, a PM uh, visit at the right time and make sure that you replace everything that's close to being uh, uh, used up or whatever and don't necessarily just place replace anything i mean it, it if, <laughs> oems have kind of two two sides to it right if if, uh, if if they if they can replace the oil uh or uh, a 10 sensors or something like that or 10 10 valves um as a part of a standard pm and and get paid for it that's great right um right. but but if for example uh uh, uh, some OEMs uh, like like in so in, for example, we have like uh, the same. You you know those those new service agreements you can get on your your house equipment. You pay one one monthly or one annual fee, and they'll come it's and like a retainer. Every, well, <laughs> and and so so in that interest, you don't want to replace everything just because there's a PM that says you're supposed to. You want to replace it when it's actually needed, so that you reduce the cost of doing that service. And so, hmm. so there's two sides to that as well. And if if that, that's why I hope OEMs will, you know, step up and make that part of it uh, as part of their 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 entire machine, you know, tracking those kind of things as part of the control, so that there is opportunities for them to tell their customers when it's time to replace the the, the valves or replace a filter when it's getting clogged, and you can measure that or um, uh, whatever else it is that you replace the oil when you potentially have either measurement that you can see this particulates in it or something like that, you know, really make it so that it becomes more, um, be, I mean, OEE is the most important thing for manufacturers today. And if you don't have to take a machine down, you have 24 uh, seven, right. Ship, right? Um, yeah, they can, definitely, if you, if you can wait and plan it more properly, the better. Right. And so that's the, that if you can be a part of helping your customers, uh, at that level, that, that, that becomes a great relationship. So, that's just my my point. So, so um, Vladimir actually made a comment here in the in the chat, and he actually added a, a question towards my post earlier yesterday on the on this topic. And um, I think it was this is a good one where he talks about the 
you know, uh, thinks about the tools that can be used to pull in data to become that'll become better over time. And maybe this whole idea of collecting this data and utilizing this data, you know, will become easier over time because there are people that want to do it more. Maybe this could even be, I, it doesn't say all of this here, but in my head, you know, maybe these could be these modules that could be added in this low, no code stuff that pushes the data somewhere. Maybe it's, uh, you know, an S3 bucket or, and that goes to glacier storage or whatever else from a cloud perspective to make it as cheap as possible. But at the it's end of the day, it's still it's a lot of data. I didn't mention that because Crosser, I mean, not to put a plug in for Crosser, but they have, they've, that's how they've expanded on the node red base is they've got it automatically set up so that, that as a customer you can do that so well that's what i was going to ask you because i mean vladimir's question from yesterday i think is a really good one and um you know there's a couple of things here but uh you know i i think this is a time to throw out some shout outs i mean this isn't a commercial discussion but you know are there strong contenders in the manufacturing automation space as far as like this 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 topic right this low no code right. topic and uh you know is the industry going open source? And if so, you know, what do you see as kind of like that lead horse? You know, is it is it something like Node Red or is it something better? And you've mentioned a few, but maybe to ask the question specifically, you know, who do you see as the big contenders in this low no code space? And and so and Cro Crosser has made it has commercialized it. Um and they actually they actually show I mean you you buy their product, but it, it's it's automatically part of a cloud functionality. Yeah, you know, like for me to test it out, they um, they gave me a cloud space um, as far as a sandbox, and I've gone through some of the the basic you know um, basic bottom line structures that they have, and the idea was to compare it Node Red to them. Um, and but the more I go through their functionality, they've already set things up so that they can go through that that for that ISA 95 type type structure and and they show like you know PLCs and sensors on the bottom and then they've got their middle ground before they go to cloud is like you know your ERP your um, MES your you know SCADA all those things um, and they claim to have uh, the structure to go or the the continuity to go to every single one of them via MQTT Ethernet HTML um, OPC, you know, any of those, you know, Modbus, you know, someone told me that Modbus was ancient and I'm like, well, Modbus is, it, it works. So I'll leave it alone. So was analog. So was digital. <laughs> right. I mean, like, but I mean, they have, they have all those structures mm -hmm. and that's what, um, so for Crosser, they've set it up. They're, they're like, I will communicate with whatever device I mean, you know, from the field to wherever. And that's, that's their MO. They don't, you know, and it doesn't matter what who makes the hardware. It's whether or not you have the 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 protocol on there, and that's what I don't know if I tied it in well before. the The hardwares that are coming out that allow you to connect A, B, C, and D, you know, that's to me we're we're going to get further away from from having a box with a name on it, as opposed to understanding hey. This box is more reliable, maybe because that name builds it better. But it, it, you know, can I communicate to it? And that's um, there's a customer in Nevada. We don't have to name names, but because of supply chain issues, you know, they've had to deal with uh, different PLCs, different um, remote IOs. You know, they have probably five different protocols on their line. Um, does it make it difficult to troubleshoot? Probably, but they've been able to be successful at creating their line and creating like their own DCS system with a mix of ignition and all of these um, other hardware brands because of the ability for the hardware to, to, you know, they're able to bring in the Modbus, the backnet, the you know, whatever, and connect it to the ignition and, 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 not be protocol or hardware dependent and you know people have tried to sell them on on the traditional dcs's or whatever and the, and the um you know they've just pushed back because they're, they're like hey we got our own thing we're making it work and you know and and you can't fault them for it you know they've made their own dcs essentially and the um to me that's where the if you understand the data if you understand your hardware and you know how to program it and connect to it 
it, it goes down to, I'm going to oversimplify it, but it's the input, the box, and the output. And that's, I mean, that's our job as controls engineers is to, if you can get the output that you want with whatever inputs, then, then do it. <laughs> yeah. And this whole idea of open, right? So like what you just described there, I think is is great that they're doing that. And, and you know, I know of, a, of an organization in more of the process side of things with the open process automation initiatives. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there it was a it was an initiative started by uh, Exxon who contracted Lockheed Martin to do a technology project to see if they could essentially replace a DCS in process control and using open source components. Initial development was done on Raspberry Pis with uh, IEC 61499, I believe which is um, just an open, well, it's it's an IC standard, you know, as far as the, the control yeah. platform. But, and then they've kind of evolved this and now it's actually uh, part of the uh, the open um, open group and things and, and it's evolving. And now there's several prototypes running across the world. And, and it's, I think the big push there is to not be beholden to a single manufacturer. And then what you mentioned, I think, enhance this, particularly in the discrete side with, with uh, the supply chain challenges everybody's faced and these kind of things, because like people were forced to either slow down production because right. they couldn't get or stuff adapt. Or, or adapt. And what you just described, I think is really cool because it's an example of somebody that adapt being from a manufacturer perspective, you know, of course I don't want anybody to adapt. I want everybody to keep my products, you know, <laughs> but, but, but in all seriousness, you know, I know what I could do and there's only so much stuff I could do. And I know Yan was in the exact same position. And if your perspective, you know, as a as a controls engineer, you're willing to help people adapt, but you need the permission and the support of the manufacturer and the lines to, to be able to do this. So right. yeah, it's an interesting time. And maybe this whole scenario has really pushed this forward um, you know, a little bit. So it's interesting times. I I think adaptability is is it. I mean, the the I'm I'm a big fan of not segmenting between DCS and discrete and, you know, process and, and discrete manufacturing and, and, you know, PLC. And I don't think we had to look at it that way. I think we had to look at it as, you know, literally we got inputs, we got outputs. Our, our job is to, to get the, the output, the expected output that we want, mm -hmm. um, based on design, based on application. Um, and then, I mean, you want you want it to be reliable because, like he mentioned, you know, OE is the big thing. And if you're not making widgets, you don't get paid. So, and that's and you want to collect data about everything. No, I'm just joking. right. And then, <laughs> but the understanding the computer part behind it, or the programming behind it, and and knowing how to put that together, um, you know, not to. I don't want to go down the ladder logic discussion, but the yeah part of it, if we're going to expand on the hardware and the um, and the software is changing to make it easier and to make more low code no code, then to to Jan's point, we we have to you have to make it so that there's a level that people can read and and that people can troubleshoot. Um, so do you do that with ladder logic or or whatever? You know, I I don't know. I think I think we have to be open to the application. Um, and then also training, you know, if it's going to change, then train your people. I mean, that's, you know, and that's, those are all things that you mentioned before about what's the holdup or what's the, you know, those are things that people don't, that typically hold, hold back the changes um, is training and then the cost of it. And then the, and reliability, reliability is probably the biggest issue. So. Yeah, I, I was involved with Exxon Mobil uh, a while back in my my uh, uh, history here, and and it, you mentioned uh, Ira or something about you know don't want to be beholden to single vendors. I, that that's definitely a part of it, but I think the bigger part of it was just the the entire required infrastructure um, when you go with a vendor, like let's say either Honeywell or Rockwell or Siemens. You got your PLCs, and then you got the different layers of uh, SCADA systems and historians and whatever else and MES. Um, and and so what you find is, especially some of those very very large customers like ExxonMobil or Lockheed, is that they're like 10, 20 versions behind, because it will take them months to go out and just upgrade to the next version. And so that was one of one part of it too, is to really take that entire layer away. If if, if they could have PLC to cloud and nothing in between, 
that would be perfect for them, right? Because that, that you've got a scalable cloud and you've got good PLCs and you can you can update a, a single PLC if you need to, right? Um, but you don't, Yokogawa's you don't have to... business model is based on that. Yokogawa advertises that they can that they're in a, their DCS can integrate from today all the way back to you know nineteen eighties. And, and right. they're they're proud of that. And so I was amused at one point because the you know, it, if you look at the flip side of Rockwell, you know, they're like, Hey, get on version thirty four and we're like why <laughs> you know and, and to your point that's that's how yokogawa's made made money so yeah yeah, yeah I, I think on the pc side it's still fairly easy i think a rockwell could uh it well that was a rockwell at least you could easily upgrade to the latest version of the rockwell software on the single plc and everything else upstream will still work as expected it's the middle layer like if you got to go out and uh it and now it's, it's different now because a lot of it is web-based but before right. it was web-based just think about I'm going to upgrade a, 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 um, a you got to touch every single server. one of them. I got to go out to every single client computer and upgrade that software too. Right. And so the, it was really about reducing that infrastructure. And so if you go open, right, that also means that it doesn't matter which PLC, if it's open, you can connect it up to what it is you have in whatever layer you have. We right? can talk to it. Yeah. You can talk to it and you can make that. And so now you have more control over it. how much of that infrastructure do, do you want in your system? And how how do you manage that, right? So that that was uh, to me at least when I was talking to Exxon Mobil, that was one of the biggest pieces. Is that you know you know we here's the latest version of 34, but I'm on 22 because that it's just there's no way I can plan that whole upgrade. It just takes too too much. Well, even the man hours and then the downtime and then Absolutely. even if it's coordinated and you only have a blip, it's like the what if. Yeah, I mean, we used to worry about the because um, even with Rockwell, your your like your chassis would go so far to to be an upgradable uh, as far as like your main controller, but then you may have a card on there because they have different levels of Ethernet card in the and Absolutely. if you don't upgrade the firmware to match the firmware that you go into on the on the PLC or you know like they put that little warning on there, it's like don't interrupt this while you're changing it, and you're like you know the the I call yeah. it the oh shits. You know, it's like something <laughs> <laughs> you never know. And then and then yeah. you're explaining yourself or then you got more downtime than what you planned. And and then and then yeah, and people get scared. So yep. Hey, we're getting close to the uh, end of this. This has been a very, very interesting conversation. I think we've gone a little bit over and above our discussion about low code, no code, and I really enjoyed where this conversation has gone. Well, thank uh, you for having me. No, absolutely. So before we end, just a, a last thoughts from your perspective, where do you think low code, no code is going and uh, and who's going to be involved? And I I think the more we embrace it, it'll, it'll change. But I think people um, need to be open to using it as a tool um, and, and then making it making it their own. I mean, that's the beauty of the, the open source software is is making it your own and and being able to create an application that that others can use and then it'd be specific to to your needs so um i think it's up to us to make that interface for the you know for ladder logic replacement or just a, a usable interface you know without throwing ladder structured text debate in there um you know and and you know investigate it I mean, it's, some of these things are free. I mean, why, <laughs> yeah. why not save some money if you got the capacity to to have someone build it and um, and then create the the user interface that you know, like you don't have to call somebody back. They can uh, work with your people to to customize it. So that makes sense. Anything uh, last thoughts from you, Ira? Yeah. So I mean, you know, high level. On all this, I do see. I mentioned it earlier, but you know, data is a very much a, a, a commodity for manufacturers as a whole. And I think the better you can do in getting that data and utilizing that data, you could debate on which data and how much data. You know, that was a debate earlier today. And I, but but actually, getting it is key. And that's okay. a lot of what this 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 low code no code can help with. And and you know, I. To, to not freak people out, you know, I kind of personally draw a line and, you know, there's the operational piece of it, which is the ladder and the structure text. So you could do the maintenance operations and these kind of things. And if you can integrate into that, 
awesome, but if you can't, at least you can layer it on top. So you can do that integration to a SCADA, to a historian, to a whatever, to a cloud, to a, you know, a, a whatever you want. sort of <laughs> space to collect data, move data. But that integration, the, the, the easier we can make that, the more accepted we can make that, the more standard we can make that, the better. And in Node Red comes up a lot. Is that the standard? I, I don't think there is one, but it is one that comes up a lot. And if there's, you know, Crossair or with these other platforms that I think are probably all like Node.js based, they're probably they that, maybe under the hood, which is awesome. It, it's really the same thing with a layer on top to make it more usable, which is good because, you know, as someone that's used Node Red, and you know, I, I can program, I can do these different kind of things, but I'm not an expert programmer. You know, I'm not, I'm not you. And um, and, but, you know, the funny thing about Node-RED is it looks easy because you make these flows until you get to the end node and you realize you actually have to write real code to actually make it do something in the end. You're like, oh, it's not just a flow that you just drag and drop things. So, you well, know, and that's easy... it. People learning JSON is, yeah. I've had to learn some JSON stuff and, and then understand and then you'll get the, you know, with Crosser, it makes it, some of the troubleshooting is easier yeah. because they have little functionality that helps you. And that's that's so good. And I, I that's that's if I had to say a takeaway, it's one of the takeaways I have is to go check out this company and see what's up and see, yeah. hey, maybe there's an opportunity um, to take a closer look at it. Yeah. And so I, um, Toby, I really appreciate your time. And yeah, and that was my my big takeaways. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I definitely thank you, uh, uh, Toby, for joining us today. It's been a great conversation. Thank uh, you. One of, one of the, the usual where we get into a lot of different things and everybody learns a little bit of everything or, or a little bit of something at least, hopefully, out of this. And that this has been a great conversation. Just want to also just uh, thank everybody that we're listening in today or watching today and uh, and also watching the recording afterwards. Uh, please join us uh, in a, a future uh, sessions here. We have uh, mainly Tuesday and Wednesdays every week. Uh, we have within our different topics about women manufacturing, manufacturing future just as today, our fireside chat and our people process and culture. And then uh, uh, we've been going through for about an hour without mentioning chat TBT, which is amazing. <laughs> I just want to mention it now as well. We do have a no. series on chat TBT. Uh, we have uh, had five episodes so far and we're continuing next week with a couple more episodes as well, continuing for a little while because it is an interesting topic and there's a lot of stuff going on with it and a lot of different opinions. So uh, uh, look at uh, our schedule on LinkedIn or on our new website, www.industry40club.com uh, and uh, connect and collaborate with us and have some fun with us. So please join us anytime you can. And uh, with that, uh, I think we are ready to uh, make it a close today. And again, thanks again, Toby, for joining us. And thanks, Ira, for, for co-hosting with me today again. It's been a pleasure. And for everybody else, have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.